if you want to finally get on your dream podcast or even just dip your toe into being a perfect guest on a podcast, today I have a special treat for you because we have a new roundtable episode all about how to pitch yourself for the right podcasts. I'm your host, Andrea Jones. This is episode number 324 of the Mindful Marketing Podcast. Before we get into the episode, though, a word from our sponsor. I've recorded over 300 podcast episodes. Yeah, it's a lot of podcast episodes. And I've tried a lot of different virtual recording studios. But my favorite has been Riverside. Riverside makes their virtual recording studio look so profesh. My guests love it. Plus, I also low-key love recording YouTube videos in here as well because it's so easy to use. My team also loves Riverside because it spits out separate audio video tracks, making editing easy breezy, lemon squeezy. And if you want a little magic, they've got this tool called Magic Clips, which uses AI to take your video and turn it into perfect social media sized videos. I'm talking vertical videos for TikTok and Instagram, Facebook Reels, all the places you can post these videos with the captions included, and you don't have to hunt and search for that perfect clip. So if you want to try this out for yourself, click the link that goes with this video, or if you're listening to the audio on the podcast, it's in the show notes. Okay. Click that link. Use the 15% off coupon code. It's Drea, D-R-E-A, and try Riverside for yourself. Thank you, Riverside. All right, let's dive into the episode. I'm excited for this because I have some amazing guests today who I've talked with and known online for a long time, but I think this is one of the first times where I got I get to like pick your brains about what you do. I'm excited. We're going to start with a round of intros. I will start with May Kay first. Introduce yourself and your business. Absolutely. And I'm super excited to be here. So thank you so much for the invitation. And we're just saying in the green room, like, oh my gosh, I actually know of like one of you for years, but you know, anyhow. So hi, my name is May Kay Thang. I use she, her pronouns. And in a nutshell, I help human first business owners to get heard and hired for their work in the world through the power of guesting on podcasts and having sustainable visibility strategies. Beautiful. Thank you, May Kay. Uh, Brittany, you're next. Yes. Hi, my name is Brittany Lynn. I uh, run a PR agency uh, called Human Connection Agency, where we work with entrepreneurs and authors um, with their visibility. So everything from podcasts, which is my favorite, my first love, but we also do other PR um, and outreach strategies such as publications, TV, um, influencer marketing, speaking opportunities, all of that kind of stuff. Beautiful. Thank you, Brittany. And Angie, you're next. Tell us about yourself and your business. Yeah. So I am the founder of the Podwise Group, and we are a consulting and training firm for business and PR leaders, helping them pitch and land interviews for their clients or their own internal leaders. So um, we've been in the podcast guesting space for coming on eight years now. So it's it's been a while. I think we all have been around for a while. <laughs> Yes. Yes. And I'll start by saying too, what I love about podcasting for me specifically is that I get to show up on someone else's podcast and just like talk about my experience. And it's a really easy way for me to be visible because there's very little prep these days because I've been doing it for so long that like, I know my stories. Um, And it feels like an easy win for me when I share it with my community as well. Um, So starting from the beginning, May Kay, this question's for you. Um, What do you think makes a podcast pitch really stand out? Oh, I can go so many different directions. But when I was looking at the notes and I thought, okay, this is what I really want to say. What's going to stand out? in the inbox is if you send an audio or video pitch. And the reason why is because the vast majority of pitches that podcasters are ever going to receive are going to be in the written format. And the reason why is because it's the easiest method to repeat and to outsource as well. But you're going to stand out in no time with a video and audio pitch because it's, again, like rarely anyone does it. And there are three reasons why this stands out. Um, one, I just said it, people rarely do it. Two, there's a lot of information you can gather from someone when you just simply hear their voice or if you see them, if you see their face. There's a lot of non-verbal communications if you're able to see someone's face. And thirdly, it's going to give them a taste of how you speak on a podcast because if you're reaching out cold 
they have no idea who you are. And even if you give them all the links in the world, they may not have the time to scour through your website or to look at everything on your press page. So if you give them a taste in like a minute or less and really succinct yourself, then it's going to really showcase your abilities as a speaker. So whether you can share a quick story, you can you know, really come home to a succinct point. They can feel your charisma, all of that good stuff. And I've used a couple of tools like SpeakPipe, Loom, Bonjoro, and BombBomb to really send these to keep it nice and simple. So that's what I think stands out a lot in a crowded inbox. Yeah, I totally agree. As someone who's like, I get probably like three or four podcast pitches a day <laughs> these days, and I only do a weekly show. So And some weeks are just me. So I can't, I literally can't accept all of them. And it becomes clear which ones are just copy pasted mass sent out to everybody. And so what I'm hearing you say is personalization is key here. So my next question goes to Brittany. When we're personalizing these pitches, how do we balance, you know, the need for efficiency, meaning we're probably pitching a few podcasts at the same time, and also making sure that we keep it personalized and have that high touch approach that makes it stand out? How do we balance all of that? Yes, such a great question and something I see often and I think people struggle with because we're all trying to be efficient with our time, you know, with podcast pitching, sometimes it is a numbers game, right? So you can't just really pitch two or three podcasts and then, you know, if you didn't get any responses to it, be like, well, podcast pitching doesn't work. You really have to send out a lot of different pitches to kind of start um, getting some yeses, Um, but it can be hard to personalize all of those pitches, you know, if you're sending out 40 in a month, it can be hard to make each of those, you know, I think when people think about personalization, they think I have to start completely from scratch, like a blank piece of paper every time and rewrite it from scratch every time. And that's not really what you need to do. Um, So one of my favorite tactics that we use with our clients Um, is we make niche specific podcast pitches. So as an example, we have a grief expert that we represent. We've represented her for over three years. And um, in that topic, you can kind of think, okay, well, like how many podcasts can you pitch her to? You know, grief is a niche type of topic. So of course we pitch her to grief related podcasts, but there's only so many of those types of podcasts. So what we do is, you know, we make topics um, on different niches. So we'll do like a grief and money podcast, like how grief affects Mm. people's financial situation, how they think about money, how they handle money. Um, there's parenting podcasts that we pitch. There's, um, podcasts there that are about like, you know, raising your kids, grief and raising your kids. Um, we pitch HR related podcasts, grief in the workplace. Whenever you're a leader and you have an employee who is going through a grief experience, how do you help support that employee? Um, and so a lot of that, we're changing up the talking points for each of those. But again, as you are, you know, someone that's listening to this episode and you're wanting to pitch yourself to podcasts, you really are going to kind of talk about the same things over and over again on different podcasts. And you're going to give different examples and you're going to have different tips, but your overall brand messaging and talking points should really stay the same. You shouldn't be changing your tips all of the time um, because you want to become known as a leader in whatever industry that you're in. And so you're going to feel like you're repeating yourself, but you have to remember you're speaking to different audiences. There's a different audience that's listening to the HR podcast versus the parenting podcast. And even if there is overlap, I think probably all of us here can relate. At least I hope I'm not calling myself out. Sometimes there's a person I start following, an author, someone online. I want to go and listen to every podcast they've ever done. Does anybody else do that? Yes. Or am yes. I just like the crazy one? Okay, great. It's not you. <laughs> so, but like we... Even if we're listening to them on different podcasts, they might have some of the same talking points, but still the interview is different because you're getting, you're interacting with a different person. Um, So I think having the combination of like doing some video audio pitches, but then also have, you know, making sure you can speak to that specific audience that you're pitching. That's the thing that you can personalize and tweak. And then the rest of it can kind of stay similar. 
Yeah. And I love this whole conversation of personalization because um, I think it just it works so well with anything we do in marketing, but specifically with the pitches, like there's so many different stories and anecdotes and ways that you can, you know, still have your same talking points, but um, kind of shape it differently for different audiences and different communities, which I love. Uh, one of the things you talked about as well, Brittany, is this idea of, you know, you, you are pitching a lot of places and not everywhere you're going to get accepted, which is why in the past I've hired someone Brittany, I've hired Brittany uh, to be like, I don't want to get rejected. So I'm going to put this, I'm going to give this question to Angie. Rejection is part of the process. I don't totally. like it. I, I hate it. Uh, what's your approach to this? Like, how do, do we just need thick skin? Like, how do we handle the nose? First of all, if I had a nickel for every client that hired us because they didn't want to get the rejection emails, <laughs> that's really what we're in the business of is insulating our clients from rejection. Um, so it's, it's totally normal. I mean, it's something we deal with every single day. And I think there's two different um, results to kind of pick apart. The first is the no, like getting a flat out no thank you. And the other is the no response. And the no response, there's not a lot that you can do with that, right? You do your follow-up sequence. We have a, you know, a really laid out plan for how we do respectful follow-up. You could always try to pitch whomever the host is on a different platform. For the most part, if we have a, a status in our ClickUp called crickets. Um, and so if we don't hear back, we just move it to the crickets column. And sometimes those will pop and we'll get responses months later. But for the most part, there's not a lot to do there. And that's why, as we talk about personalization and the actual pitch, it is so important to get that first pitch pretty well nailed so that you can get a response. And that's actually what I see our goal as like, yes, our clients want yeses, but my primary goal is to get some form of response back from whoever we are hosting. Um, some sign of life that someone read it and felt compelled enough to send us an email back. From there, we actually have the opportunity to start building a relationship unless it was not a great pitch and they were basically like, don't ever email us again, which we don't get that often, right? It happens occasionally, but it's fine. Um, really? Yeah. Two weeks ago, I pitched, it was a host that we've never pitched before. I sent a client uh, to him. Like I had a really nice pitch, totally personalized to his show. He wrote back really quickly. I can't express to you how appreciative I am that you took the time to understand our show. He said, while she is not a good fit, I think she would be a better fit for my friend's show who hosts and talks to this type of audience. So he gave me a referral to someone else to where if it had been this templated pitch, he would not have taken the time because it wouldn't have felt human. And then I told him, thank you. And I also said, we have another client, like I offered up if in the off chance a CPA coming on your show would be a good fit, let me know. I can work up some angles. And he was like, yeah, let me hear what you got. That would be really interesting. So I only say that to illustrate the no when done right is the beginning of a relationship. It doesn't always end up in a yes for your client, but it can end up in maybe a yes for someone down the road or you being able to connect that host with someone else. And like relationships is what this is all about candidly. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I have to say, having worked with um, Brittany and Angie, getting pitches from your both of your clients from <laughs> or from your team for your clients for my podcast, to me, I'm already like, oh, I'm curious because you take the time to know the show. You take the time to find the topics that fit in with the show. Um, and we have relationships built already. So when I see the name in the inbox, I'm like, well, let me consider this versus sending my templated, like, uh, here's the wait list. Cause yeah. like, mm -hmm. I don't know if this is a fit or not. Right. And so the relationships piece, I love, I love that. And the crickets, like I'm already imagining putting a little cricket emoji in the, cr the cricket <laughs> category. And love to that. that point, like just to reiterate, that's really common. It's you are not going to get a response from every single person you pitch. You are going to get no's. Like the point of putting yourself out there, you're going to get no's. It's the nature of it. Like, and like Angie said, you know, some people hire people to do it for them so that they don't personally have to receive the no's. But like, I'm telling you, like, 
Angie and I get so many no's in a day, like mm-hmm. you wouldn't even believe. And now I'm just like, I don't care. I didn't get the no. My client got the no. You know, it's it's just kind of the nature of the game. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. And something to add on to the whole rejection no thing. I remember back in the day when I did used to pitch for clients because now I have a DIY course and I'd rather and I teach it instead. Right. But back when I used to pitch for clients, I remember really looking out for the no's because the no's weren't coming to me about my business I'm pitching on behalf of a client. It didn't hurt as much, first of all. (laughs) And also, depending on the kind of feedback, if you do get a response that isn't just a plain, like flat out, no thank you. And if there's actually an insight you can gather from there. So I actually have a column in my spreadsheet for pitching that has that is called reason for no. And sometimes I detected a pattern as to why we were getting no's. And that actually made me switch our strategy a little bit. So earlier, Brittany, when you were um, talking about niche specific stuff, so my client um, had a topic that can apply to different industries, but instead we honed in on the HR industry in particular, and then we got a lot more yeses. And so sometimes if you're able to take the sting out of a no, if you're not Um, working with an agency and you're pitching yourself, for example, you may find there are opportunities to see where you can pivot a little bit for your strategy if there's a pattern that's emerging from your nose. Yes. Okay. On that same vein, McKay, what are some of the common mistakes that you see um, as your clients are, you know, going through the course and they're trying to find um, podcasts to pitch and they're just not getting a lot of yeses? What are some of the mistakes that you see them um, coming across? Well, not so much my clients because I've taught them. But <laughs> oh, yes, of course. <laughs> no, I'm joking, before I'm joking. taking your course, no. then before. <laughs> I mean, the first thing that comes to mind, and this is a, it's a phrase, a mantra, if you will, that I teach them, and it's called service over self-importance. And where this stemmed from is because as someone who's the host of my own podcast, The Quiet Rebels, I have received many, many pitches over the last five years of hosting it. And the number one thing that always makes me tag an email to put in the bad pitches label, <laughs> so um, because I do have some and I look, I look through them for patterns about, you know, so I can actually make it a teaching point. And it's always when someone is focused too much on their accolades and their experience, how much money they're making, and they've really missed the point as to why they're reaching out to me in the first place. And so when I teach my clients service over self-importance, it's really about putting yourself in the host shoes and ask yourself truly and honestly, if I were to receive this pitch myself, would I say yes to this? Hmm. And if, the, if it's not a heck yes, and it's been like, mm, uh, maybe, then there is something there that needs to be adjusted because it's likely that your balance of self-importance and service is a bit out of whack. I think it's okay to you know mention, of course, your experience and things, but that shouldn't overshadow your ability to provide value to that person's audience because ultimately what you're asking for, you're asking someone to put you in front of their community that they've built over goodness knows how long, weeks, months, years even. And so we need to really acknowledge that it's a true privilege to be on someone else's podcast, like today, for example, case in point. And so it's really important to show up knowing how you can provide value. But if you lead with all of your, all of the things that make you, you know, credible and how you're a six, seven, eight figure earner, if that shadows it, then is going to often be a no. And there is one thing, there's one story that comes to mind for this. Someone only had a self-importance based pitch. And they were so presumptuous that I was going to give them the spot that they said, when you're ready, this is the first outreach, by the way, completely cold. They said, when you're ready, here's the link to my calendar so we can record the interview. <laughs> exactly people <laughs> are unhinged people are unhinged i mean i mean oh, kudos wow. for the kudos for the confidence but no and never and so um earlier when um we were speaking about it being a relationship based thing because it really is um, i think angie was talking about this and so the biggest mistake is burning the bridge before you've even had a chance to build it by having pitches that are completely about self-importance that is how you burn a bridge. That how that is how a relationship never gets to be built. So just don't do that. <laughs> yeah. 
oh my gosh i'm like reeling from this <laughs> sending their own calendar link yeah what like mm -hmm. in the first conference i can understand yeah. if there was some back and forth and you're trying to get yeah. schedules and then oh, right okay i have sure. this email in my badge in my bad pitched label in my gmail i, I would bring like it back it, to the forefront <laughs> i love that you have i also have a folder that's called Same. Bad pitches. <laughs> if we, if you guys you. <laughs> we just launched our newsletter we revamped it it's called the flop files and each week i take a bad pitch from myself or someone, feel free to send them to me. I Obsessed. anonymize I it. it so they don't know who the show is, who the client is. Right. But I say like, it's great because we're not making fun of it because I do candidly think coming from traditional PR into podcast pitching, they're just really different beasts. Um, but I identify like what needs to be changed and then I rewrite it. Um, mm. And it's been so fun. It's like my favorite thing to do every week. Yes. <laughs> that sounds so fun. And just to add yeah. on to that, I, I kind of forgot that I have this like mini series. I've only done three episodes because it was kind of like a seasonal thing. But I ran a series called Pitches That Piss Off Podcasters. <laughs> And what I did was I got together with my podcaster friends. So say if I have one particular host, they bring to the forefront two to three pitches and I do ask them to anonymize whether they choose to or not is up to them. But um, so we are there is more from an educational perspective, just same as you, Angie, with your flop files. I love that name. Mm -hmm. And basically what we did is that we talked about why this pitch didn't land, because sometimes it's more of a constructive thing. It's not purely about make it wasn't about making fun of it at all. Instead, mm -hmm. it was like, look, this is why it didn't land. It may feel a little bit different when you're the one writing it. But again, it's putting yourself in the host shoes by hearing from the hosts themselves. So I have three episodes on that. It's like free on my website if anyone wants to check that out. And and um, yeah, we just like really like break down, critique, show very real pictures that we received as podcasters. And it was really, really fun to run that series. I actually might bring it back now that we're talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Inspiration happening here. You heard it first. You heard it first. Um, okay. So next question is all about pitching strategies, because one of the things I noticed with working with you, Brittany, which I... It's been like what four years <laughs> since we three, were three, yeah, three or yeah. four, yeah. That's what I bet. Um, but one of the things that really stood out to me was how you customize the pitches to like what was happening in the world at large, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. feels so basic now that I say it, but I've never would have thought to do that strategy before. So when you're crafting these, how do you, how do you know when it's the best time to pitch a certain topic to a certain podcast and then to like follow up on that? Like what's your process in, in building this um, pitching strategy? Yeah. So we kind of do, our agency kind of does like a two pronged strategy of, you know, we can make really any of our topics that we're pitching our clients evergreen where it's relevant kind of any time of year, any month, you know, because some podcasters and this like differentiates between podcasts. And so if you're new to this industry and you're trying to figure it out, some podcasters, you'll record an episode, the episode comes out in a couple weeks. Sometimes you'll record an episode, it comes out in three months. Sometimes you record an episode, it comes out in nine months. Sometimes you're like, it comes out the next day. You know, there's really, it's a mixed bag. And so, um, you know, typically I would say in general, bigger podcasts probably plan out a little bit further in advance. Um, that's kind of just a general thing. Um, but what we do is, you know, we have the kind of the evergreen topics that can be relevant anytime, any place. Um, but then there's other times where there's specific times of the year that might be um, a really big time of year for my particular client or for that particular podcast. So as examples, you know, health and wellness podcasts, if you're, those are big, you know, health, people are looking at health and wellness a lot. New Year's resolution time, beginning of the year, they're starting new fitness journeys, or they're trying to eat healthier, or they're exercising more. Um, and so they're likely going to want people that can talk about those topics at that time of year. Um, you know, some people, if you have, you know, parenting or kids podcasts, um, back to school time is a big time. Um, so to kind of um, not pitch too late for those types of opportunities. I'll do three to four months out of those. I feel like that gives a bit of time to be able to record the episode and then for them to be able to release the episode. 
Um, but also we look at what our clients, um, their time of their important time of years. So I have a sleep client who, um, May is Better Sleep Month. And so a lot of times we'll want, and they they're, they own Better Sleep Month and they have a lot of media that go out during the month of May. And so we'll start doing pitches for those, um, for podcasts, you know, around the beginning of the year to hopefully have those episodes air out. Um, I will say podcasts in general are pretty good about at least authors that have books coming out. Um, they kind of podcasters have an understanding of they know it'll be important to have that episode come out around the published date. Now, you can't always get exactly what you want, so you can always ask for it, but don't be demanding. <laughs> you know, take what you can get. Um, it's not going to be the end of the world if the episode comes out three weeks after your published date, in all honesty. It helps better if you have some that kind of trickle out instead of all of them coming out in the same week. Um, so yeah, just kind of thinking of now what you can pitch. Um, and again, traditional media, you can kind of pitch a little bit closer to the date podcasts again, just because of the nature. Like you said, Andrea, most people have one episode a week. That's four podcast episodes a month. That's 52 in a year if they take no breaks. And if they take guests for every single one of those episodes, which is often not the case. Um, so you just have to plan a little bit ahead. So kind of think three, four months out, you know, plan the next quarter and start pitching um, on that behalf. And then um, in terms of follow up, I am curious what everybody else has to say, too, because we have our own. Everybody has their own strategies, you know. Um, and here's the thing, too, like I love like learning from other people in the industry. Like this is so, I love hearing from other people's strategies and what works for them. So um, it's all just like not competition at all. Like I, lo I love learning from everyone. So if you do this as well, like I hope you're taking notes too. Um, follow up, I for podcasts, I do anywhere from like 10 to 14 days after I sent the initial pitch. If I haven't heard back. Um, obviously if they have said an outright, no, I'm not following up with them because they said no. Um, but I like to give podcasters a little bit more time because again, it, it's a big ask to, you know, a podcaster one has a lot of things going on. A lot of times the podcast that you're pitching, they don't do their podcast full time. It's like they're using their podcast as a marketing tool. And so they need some time to be able to think about, do I have space for this person? Do I want this person? Does this fit into my content calendar that I already have? Um, I will say I have never had somebody say, oh my God, I can't believe you followed up. You horrible person. I hate you. Don't ever talk to me again. I've only had people say, thank you so much for following up because you might not hear from someone for a million different reasons. And one of those reasons is that they hate your pitch and think you're stupid. You know, like that's not most of the time the reason why it's they're on vacation. They had a big launch. They're busy in business. Their kids got sick. They got sick. You know, I, I don't know. There's a million reasons why they didn't respond. Um, so please, please follow up because that's where a lot of our bookings at least come from. I'd love to hear from everyone else on the panel if that's yeah. true for them too. Yes. Let's, let's pass this question along. I'll go to you, Angie, first. Um, tell us about your process and especially the mm -hmm. follow-ups. Yeah, we do similar. Our first follow-up goes out anywhere between a week to two weeks after the initial pitch. Typically we have an automation and click up that sets it for two weeks being the due date. And then if we don't hear back from that follow-up, we send one last follow-up and that typically is another two weeks later. We may try to offer up a different topic. Sometimes on that third outreach, we keep them very, very short. So it's, yep. we don't repitch. We just actually respond to the original pitch. Yep. Um, if we have looked at their show and we see sort of an opportunity that's more timely in nature, we will sometimes offer up a different topic, but it's pretty standard. Um, and I want to thank you, Brittany, for, so you can tell that you came from PR, um, because of the timeliness and how you're looking at the calendar. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something we don't see that a lot in podcasts, which is a benefit, right? During election season, we're not fighting the loud mm -hmm. news media, 
Um, but I think it's something that we can all take to heart of, okay, is there a way that I can put a more timely slash urgent spin on this topic to elicit some sort of response? So I think that's really good for the listeners to kind of keep in mind. Yeah, I think to that point, you know, we, as a way that we used it for a podcast pitch, um, a, how, I don't, it was earlier this year, I think that, um, Taylor Swift had like put together a, um, grief like playlist or something that like kind of made news of her songs. And it was like the five stages of grief. And she like put her songs like in each of the five stages. Well, my client, um, talks against the five or has some myths about the five stages of grief. So we use that as a talking point because Taylor Swift is very popular to talk about. A lot of people talk about her. Um, my client was talking about grief. This was relevant to so grief. Smart. And my client was saying, you know, it's something against, you know, something a little bit divisive against what was being stated by the media. So not everybody was, um, saying the same thing as my client, which can be helpful in getting somebody to say yes to you. Because a lot of times all of us have received pitches and it's like, you see the same talking points over and over and over again. That's like, okay, cool. Like Joe Schmo and everybody can talk about this topic. Like give me something different. Um, so that's just an example of like, we used a hook that's happening in media. So like, you know, looking at what's going on in media, what people are talking about, like you said, upcoming is, the election year, people are talking about that. Some people are going to want to put that into their pitches and have something relevant. And some people aren't, you know, you don't have to go with every topic that's being talked about, but if you can, if it's an easy connection, that makes it so you are relevant to talk to right now versus I'm going to put this person on the back burner and wait to interview them. And then they never interview you. Yeah, so I 100% smart. agree with that. And and that's the thing that I'm finding with my show is that there are so many interesting pitches that I get where I'm like, oh, okay, I am going to do this, but it's going to have to wait because there's topical things that I have to talk about. Like yeah. our next episode after this is marketing during an election year. And it's like, well, I talk about that now. I can't talk about that, you know, in February. <laughs> it just doesn't right. make any sense, right? So yeah. yeah, I love this. Okay, May K, from you, um, what do you tell your students about following up? Like what's the process there? So it's very similar to what's already been shared. So for me, in my pitch spreadsheet so there's a there's like a tracker so you can keep track of everything um i always encourage them to put the precise date that they have reached out to just so that they know how long you know just they can kind of, kind of do the math <laughs> um with uh, you know when it's time to follow up so i always say between seven to ten days i personally choose anywhere between three to five follow-ups but just like i think angie said uh, just keep it short and sweet reply to the actual thread that you already started in your email because we're more likely to look at emails that have a little number next to them like, like oh wait hang on there's been three emails why have i not opened this yet so um that that's something that comes to mind for sure and something that i also want to mention is that when someone responds back to you with a not right now i follow up and ask them when would be the right time and say, oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that this may not be the right season. Um, do you have a guesstimate time when it would be better for me to reach out? Three months, six months. So I'm already kind of being a bit proactive for when to uh, follow up in the future. So case in point, there was a video pitch that I, I remember sending and it took me a year to get a yes because time wow. just was not on my side and the um, the seasons. But the thing is, what I kept doing was I stayed top of mind with both the team member of that particular podcaster because that podcaster was pretty big so um their team handled more of the of the emails right any of the pitches so i even wound up using the team member's name in my in my repitch if you will so they're like hey i was like hey host name i was like hey team member name and like I'm the one who actually answers. It's, it's great. So stay top of mind as well. And you'd be surprised at what comes up. So just be proactive about it. That if you get a not right now, take that as an opportunity to ask when would be the right time, because you can reiterate your, your passion, your enthusiasm for wanting to share value and everything without repitching the entire thing. But um, that would be a great opportunity for you to kind of like wedge yourself in for a little later if time is not on your side for your first point of contact. 
Yeah, the running thread I'm hearing in all of this is be a freaking human. Like yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. humans living their lives over here and we can also be humans living our lives and also pitching the podcast and not being a robot, uh, which I love. <laughs> and I think there's a, there's a value in that for sure. Uh, okay, is. Andy. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh, me. Just, okay. uh, quick thing. Uh, so, you know how earlier we were talking about rejection? Um, mm -hmm. I, I love that it's already been said in this conversation that there are, the, there are so many other things, so many reasons why someone would not respond to you. And it's, that's, to me, helped me not take it personally because I'm like, I am not the center of anyone else's universe. And I need to acknowledge that. We all need to acknowledge that. <laughs> you know, they have other things to do, other priorities. So if you are particularly sensitive to rejection like myself and many of us here, it seems, um, just remember that they have other things going on and just do your part that's all you can do. You can send your first pitch. You can do your follow-ups between seven to 10 days. And um, if they still don't respond, then, you know, you can either loop back to them again if you want, or as I think Angie said, put in the crickets column. And who knows, there might be someone who comes back one day. Yeah. I feel like I need t-shirts printed for people. I am not the center of the universe. Here, here's your t-shirt. Because like, <laughs> sometimes it does feel that way. Um, okay, Angie, you have this question. I want to ask about success. So to me, sometimes success is, yay, I got the, you know, I got the spot. Um, but are there any other measures of success as we're kind of diving into pitching podcasts? What can we look for to be like, yes, I am doing the right things? Yeah. Um, I think getting on the show can be a measure of success, but it does depend on what the business goal is. Um, all of us here advocate for being very strategic and making sure that you are getting in front of audiences that are most likely to take action on what you want them to take action on. So getting the yes is the first step. Well, pitching strategically is the first step. Then you get the yes. Then you really have to decide what is the action that I want the audience to take. And it goes back to business goals. So if awareness is the goal, then yeah, getting on some of the bigger shows or a larger number of shows can kind of check that box, right? But if your goal is to sell more books or to book discovery calls, or it really wouldn't be to grow your LinkedIn following, but that could be a call to action that leads into something else. If it's to grow your podcast, then you need to keep that top of mind. And all of those are measurable. And we yeah. measure all of those. So I have seen a shift in the time that I've been doing this. I feel like guesting was an incredible list builder back in the day for email list growth. It still happens, but not at all at the volume that it used to. Mm -hmm. And so when we have new clients or if we're working with PR firms that are pitching their clients, we need to be very clear that if the success of your business is dependent on your email list growing in size. Guesting is probably not the most immediate path to success. Running ads would probably be your best bet. But those other more human-centered ways of interaction and taking action are totally best served from podcast guesting because they hear you, they get to know you, they like you. And then if you have one call to action that's like, go sign up for my flop files or go connect with me on LinkedIn and tell me what you thought. They feel that human connection and are more compelled to do it. Yeah. And I'll say anecdotally for myself, my best clients and students come from podcasts that I've been guests on. Yeah. Like, and they'll <laughs> tell me, I still remember, um, I was on Claire Pell's podcast in what, 2021, 2020. And one of my members who's still in my membership has like gone to all my live events. She told me that she heard me on that podcast. and was like, this is my vibe. And then like came into my yes. world. And like, to me, that's the beautiful thing about podcast guesting because podcasting already is so intimate. Like you're literally in someone's head. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then being on someone else's podcast is basically that host is vouching for you and allowing you it's like a huge honor to be on the show and share your perspective. And so, um, to me, 
the wins are yes getting more awareness but in a way that is more intimate than a lot of the other marketing formats sure. which i love but it is a long game it's yeah. a long game for sure for sure yeah. well and to give you some of that credit you know people hire people like me and angie to you know do it on their behalf sometimes or if you're going to diy um, so getting the interview is great, but then the next part is actually the biggest part is doing a good interview. <laughs> and so Andrea to like, you know, brag on you, that person resonated with you because you were prepared for that interview. You interviewed well, you brought up good talking points. You know, it, it's not just about getting on the interview and, oh, then it's just, just easy. Like then the, the email list floods in and the Instagram follows come. It's like, you have to do a good job on the interview. And so you have to be prepared for those interviews. And I think that's a part that sometimes people forget about. It's like, that's really what you really, where you got to succeed is like do a good interview, um, to get people to, you know, want to sign up for your services or discovery call or buy your book or whatever. And so a lot of times for us in the, you know, done for you services way where we're representing clients, it's like, I can do everything up until you have to do the interview. I have to have a client that can deliver good talking points. I, I can teach them as much as I can, but at the end of the day, I can't do the interview on their behalf. They have to do that. That's on them. Um, so I think that that's something to keep in mind too, of just like practicing your talking points, being a good interviewee, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think that that's like a whole, I, we may need like a part two to this yeah. episode. Like, we need a part okay. two panel. I, I, yes. I have things to you say got the pitch. Then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got yes. the pitch now. What? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Round table part two. We'll schedule it in for the new year. <laughs> um, okay. Last, I have two more questions for all of you. Um, the first question is what's one thing you wish you had known when you started? Um, May Kay, I want to start with you. What's one thing you wish you had known when you started pitching? <sighs> There could have been so many things, but the one that I chose to land with is this one. You don't need to be on as many podcasts as you think you do. Mm. I'm seeing some really deep nods there, like especially for mm -hmm. Brittany. <laughs> and yes. the reason why is because every podcast you're ever going to be on is pretty much going to live on the internet forever. They are going to be brilliant for backlinking to your website. And once you get a good momentum of, you know, getting some podcast appearances under your belt, you also might just find that you're going to get invitations because now you've built up a reputation. You are known for something, as Angie was saying earlier, like be known for something. And um, it's going to significantly reduce your need for pitching. Obviously, it depends on your personal goals and your measures of success. But it's because I remember that how I made it in this world, like quote unquote made it in this world, is I made quite a splash in the copywriting world in particular back in 2019. And the reason why is because I pitched to, and this is a cautionary tale, do not do this, okay? I pitched to 101 podcasters in 30 days and they were all personalized, all very researched, and I got a 33% booking rate. And I kind of... I don't regret doing it, but I will never do it again because then if at one point I, I stopped myself from pitching on a certain day, if it started feeling transactional, and I think that's the key here, that when you only chase the numbers and you forget the human intimate connection that can happen from podcast guesting, then then you kind of like miss the point, <laughs> you know? And so you really don't need to be on as many podcasts as you think you do. And every podcast is repurposable. So say if you had a timely thing in your world, that's something that's time sensitive, maybe a launch, you can always bring back an old podcast episode to kind of like showcase your authority that you know what you're talking about in this area. And also don't underestimate the fact that if you built that beautiful bridge of a relationship, one, that host can invite you back Two, that host can recommend you to other people. And three, just as um, um, Andrea has experienced, um, when you build that relationship, you will find that the 
best people will stay in your orbit because they trust you. And um, you might just find some, I like to call them backdoor opportunities that otherwise wouldn't have been available to you. And that's because you took the time and the effort to really show up, not just in the pitch, but on the interview and you've really made your mark. So you don't need to be on as many as you think you do. Yeah, I think this episode is a great example of that. All of you, I don't think any of you pitched me. I was just like, <laughs> I need, I want to do a roundtable on this topic and I know exactly who I need to ask, you know? So I feel like <laughs> that is case in point. Okay, Brittany, over to you. What's one thing you wish you'd known when you started? Um, what I would suggest to people is think outside of just the top 200 podcasts, you know, the big, big podcasts podcasts. I think a lot of times, especially when people get started and they're trying to pitch themselves to these opportunities, they really look at the very big podcasts. When I say very big, I mean the ones at the top of the Apple charts, Spotify charts, the ones that have 5,000 ratings, 6,000 ratings, all of that kind of stuff. To be honest, if you're new to being a guest on a podcast, most likely you are not going to get onto those very big podcasts without having some type of connection, relationship, introduction, being a student of those people. I'm not going to say that it never happens, but it, it rarely happens. You need to kind of build up. Um, and I've been on some big, big podcasts myself. I've been on, you know, mid-sized podcasts. I've been on smaller podcasts, same with my clients. And a lot of times people discount those small to mid-sized podcasts because they think it's not worth their time um, because they're not as big. Bigger does not always mean you're going to get the biggest return on investment of your time. Um, everybody here is nodding because they know, because <laughs> they know. This is the lesson we all learned, okay? Um, so again, that's why we, um, as an agency, we do pitch big podcasts, you know, I'm not saying not to do it at all, but, um, finding those niche podcasts, guys, there's a podcast on literally every single topic you can think of. Like you are a fly fishing expert. I don't know. There's fly fishing podcasts. Okay. Like any topic you can think of, there's a niche for it. So, um, and a lot of times those listeners, you know, it, it might small, but mighty, yeah. And so those people take action. They really trust the podcast hosts and who that person invites on. And I mean, I'll just speak to my experience. Sometimes when I've been on bigger podcasts, do I get a flood of requests to work with me? Yes. Are they all people that I want to work with? No. <laughs> <laughs> that then on some of the smaller podcasts, it's like I get really quality leads from and I'm like, this is the podcast for me. Like I want to come back on this podcast. I want to be a regular guest. So really don't discount those small to mid-sized podcasts because those can actually be a lot more effective overall for your business or whatever your goals are with doing podcasting versus some of the big ones where you think it's going to be this big splash. And maybe sometimes it is. And sometimes it sends you a bunch of people that maybe you don't necessarily want to work with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hard agree. Hard agree. Love that one. Uh, Angie, over to you. What's one thing you wish you had known when you started? That there's no such thing as a perfect pitch that like the bar for standing out is fairly low and if you go back to just being a human in your communications, being your authentic self, it, it can work. You know, you can get the yeses, which will get you to the interview to be able to figure out if it's a strategy that makes sense and works for you. So it's just that it's far simpler than I think I built it up to be because I started it as a freelancer after pitching myself to be a guest. And then when I started pitching clients, I think I got nervous that then I had to be a professional pitcher um, and nothing. I don't have a formal PR background. You know, it's just being human and communications. And that is what converts in podcasting. Yes. Love that. Love that. Human. Humanness of yeah, it all. That's it. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, one more question, but before I get to that, listeners, got to remind you what's happening in the Savvy Social School. Coming up, we have a brand new session called the Content Collab. It's part brainstorming, part masterminding. I have all of the ideas. Come on in and join me if you're in the school, and we'll come up with ideas together for your content. Uh, that's at SavvySocialSchool.com. All right, last question for our guests. What's coming up next for your business? May Kay, let's start with you. Oh, there could be so many things, but I'm just going to keep it nice and simple. So, um, so I mentioned in this episode that I do have a DIY course on podcast guesting. So it's not just the pitch stuff, it's everything before, during and after. So I'm working on its final evolution of my ultimate podcast guesting course, which will in uh, the reason why I'm upgrading it is because I just want to like splinter it into like little bite-sized mini lessons. I want to incorporate an Easter egg hunt, a decision-making tree. So you're not wasting time going through the entire course. You can just find the exact lesson you want and also including co-pitching calls. So actually having some accountability for all my members for um, I'm actually making sure they're writing pitches every quarter, at least just so that they've got something going on. So taking uh, Brittany's advice of like, you know, being timely, like each quarter, hmm, what's coming up in the next quarter, that would be a fantastic way to go. So that final evolution is going to be coming out at the end of 2024. So at the time of this recording, depending on where you're listening, is at www.makeasang.com forward slash UPG if you're interested in checking that out. And um, yeah, that's that's really exciting for me because of all the fun stuff because I've done digital Easter egg hunts and they're so fun. So little prize, like little dopamine hits like, throughout the course <laughs> you're going to be able to find. So I'm really excited for that. <laughs> That's so cute. I love that. Congrats on the final evolution of that course. Love it. Thank and you. I'll put all the links mentioned in the show notes on landreacom slash 324. Brittany, over to you. What's next for you and your business? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, what I have coming up in my business, I, um, again, so uh, founder of Human Connection Agency, you can go check out our website, humanconnectionagency.com for our services. Um, we really focus on doing done for you for clients. So not only just podcasting, um, publication pitching, TV pitching, um, speaking, partnerships, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and so I'm really focusing on working with more authors. So if you have a book coming out in 2025 and you need PR support, whether you are with a traditional publisher or a mid-sized publisher, I promise you, you will need extra PR support because the publishers are not going to have enough time to support you. <laughs> um, so I've been working on um, a lot of books over the past couple of years, and I really love the, do that, doing that and helping authors really just like bring their book to more and more people. I love reading. Um, so it's really just a passion of mine. So if you're an author that has a book coming out in 2025, um, hit me up, go to humanconnectionagency.com. Yay. Awesome. Thanks, Brittany. And Angie, over to you. What's coming up next for you and your business? Yeah. So over the summer, the Podwise group started leaning into our consulting and training with PR firms, and I have loved every minute of it. So helping firms that have never pitched their clients for podcasts or helping optimize what they are doing um, has been great. So workshopping in real time and then even licensing some of our internal training. So we're just going to continue leaning into that, uh, connecting with firm owners and their account execs. And that's really where the Flop Files newsletter came from. Um, so if anyone wants to check it out, it's at the podwisegroup.com slash flop files. Um, yeah. Beautiful. And I'll have all yeah. those links for y'all in the show notes on slash 324. Thank you so much, everyone, for being on this episode. It's so fun. So, so fun. <laughs> Next up on the podcast, I'm talking about marketing during an election year because y'all, it is noisy out here. And I want to talk about what we're doing, ask some questions, give you some prompts, things to think about. So that will be coming up next on the podcast. In the meantime, make sure you give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It helps keep us in the top 100 marketing podcasts. And that's all because of you and your support, which I so appreciate. Thank you so much. I'll be back next Tuesday. Bye for now.